let me introduce myself to you, okay? I'm not connected to the Jewish Center, except by membership and marriage. <laughs> uh, why by marriage? She's the president of the Jewish Center, okay? <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about her a little bit later. And uh, so I'm a member here. And uh, my wife's grandfather was the founding president in this congregation in 1917. And he was a regular member and worshiper here until 1959 when he died. And my wife's grandmother was here uh, until 1991 when she died. And uh, so my wife has been connected to this genetically, uh, culturally, uh, religiously, and in leadership here for 94 years. Okay? Uh, it's an 11-story building. Many things go on in this building that are directly related to the congregation, and some things not. And we might talk about that a little bit later, okay? Um, so who am I? I'm a fairly good husband and a fairly good father to uh, uh, 13 grandchildren, and they live in New Jersey and in, and in New York, mostly in New Jersey, uh, and some are in Israel. One's going to the Israeli army tomorrow, and so uh, that's sort of what's going on with that. I'm at Yeshiva University. I was a vice president there for many years in charge of the rabbinical school. And now I run a think tank on the interface of Judaism and general culture. I edit things. Um, who's the writer here? So I, I do some, some books and edit books with Rabbi Sarna, which is coming out soon. And um, I teach rabbinical students. And I do stuff with birthright alumni on a volunteer basis. And I was involved in the design of this program with Rebecca Sugar, who is the mother of this uh, program in partnership with JEC. Okay? So what you see, I'm partially responsible only for the good things, all the other things they did themselves. Okay? You got that joke or you didn't get that joke? Okay, tell me. Okay. Uh, okay. So what's this about tonight? Uh, the first time I met with the group, and this is going to take about an hour and a half, that's okay? For you? Okay? If we want to finish earlier, I'll fall asleep. Um, that's why it's always easier to speak than to listen, uh, because it keeps you much more alert. But I'll try to keep you involved as much as I can. Uh, the first time I gave this, uh, provided this session, it was in a synagogue on 29th Street. And as usual for the sessions that are here, what does it usually do outside? Rain, correct. It's rain. That's what I said. So I get to the building about a quarter after six, and the building's locked. It's 29th Street between Lex and Third. In fact, it's the oldest synagogue in that in its in its location in the city. It's over 150 years old. Atarit Bet El, I think it's called. And uh, I know the rabbi in the synagogue. He's a student of mine, and I come to the building. It's locked. So I said, you know, we have a program in 15 minutes. I, I gotta go. I have to go in there. Can't, I cried his telephone number, not there. Uh, finally, a woman walks out, from, not from the synagogue building, but in a building that looked like it was attached to it. And um, I said to her, you know, I have to come in. There's a program here. Could you let me in? She says, no, I can't do that. I said, but you just came from there. No, I can't let you in. Said, Aren't you from the synagogue? Well, not really. I rent an apartment in a synagogue building uh, upstairs, but I'm not allowed to let anyone in. So I said, look, I, I, I'm kosher. I'm, I'm, I'm a rabbi. I'm at Yeshiva University. I took out my card. I showed her my card. Could you let me come in? She said, I'm not, I'm not allowed to do that. I said, but I have a class in. They're going to come with food and other things. I don't know where anybody else is. She says, all right, I'll let you in. But just don't tell anybody to let you in. Now, how do you think I felt out there? Wanting to get into that synagogue, and I couldn't. How do you think I felt? Frustrated. Frustrated. I felt like an outsider. No one knew who I was. And I was imagining what it would feel for people who had never been meaningfully involved in a synagogue. And if they came, how would they feel? They would feel like outsiders. And no Jew should ever feel like an outsider in a synagogue. So the idea is to convert someone, small c, from an outsider into an insider. So what I want to do with you this evening is to try to get rid of all of those things that make people feel like they're outsiders. 
and give them a sense that they really could be, in very short order, insiders. How much they want to be inside, how often, that's a different question. But they should not be able to say, I am locked out, or I lock myself out, okay? So that's what sort of motivated this, this session. So what I want to do is to talk about, uh, to share with you, um, things about sort of, the, I'd say, the, the architecture of this room, the structure of a synagogue, and also some introduction to what goes on here, uh, but other things go on here, which you're going to hear in a minute, in this room. I'm not talking about other floors in the building or anything else, just in this room, okay? If you had to say, what is the primary thing you think goes on in this room, what would you say? Prayer. Prayer. Okay. You're going to qualify that by prayer. Okay? Second word you were going to say was prayer for? Worship. Worship. Okay, worship. good. Prayer, worship. Okay, fine. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a conceptual question. All right? Anyone in this room ever pray? Ever. Yeah. What was the circumstance that led you to pray? Gratefulness. Gratefulness. Okay, so one reason to pray would be at a sense of gratitude, right. correct? Anyone else ever pray that with a different uh, characterization? Desperation. So that would be not a state of apprecia appreciation or gratitude, but it would be a state of need, correct? Okay, anyone ever have a different circumstance? Hope. Hmm? Hope. Hope. Okay. Or, or hmm? others with medical, you know, circumstances. Okay. Hope. Someone else's need, but your expression is, or is empathetic. Yeah. Right? Helping. Okay, good. Okay. So I'll ask you, you recognize that someone is in need, and you're not in need, and you're not in a state of appreciation, but you're in a state of sort of acknowledgement of recognition of something to be done, you join the process. So conceptually or theoretically now, how often should a person pray? All the time. Hmm? All the time. Why all the time? What's your name again? Anna. Anna, go ahead. Because uh, there's different circumstances in which you need to speak to God. So you could speak to God all the, t all the time. But that's true. You could speak to God all the time. But, but why would you say all the time? Based upon what we just established. There's different needs. There's different um, circumstances in which we feel the desire to speak to God. So a question. I'll leave God out for a moment. Okay. But that's okay. You're right. Is there ever a time that I'm not in need? No. Give me basic things that I need. Food, water, shelter. Excellent. What's your name again? Alana. Alana. So give me your names initially so I can get it again. Anna, I'll get twice now, okay? Mm -hmm. She's separated, but that's okay. So one, I'm always in a state of need. Let's do the other circumstance that was mentioned. Well, I, a state of appreciation, appreciation correct? And what, what, a state of need? I do need those things, and when I have them, I'm grateful for them. And the third is? <coughs> Empathy, feeling for others, praying for others to have those needs. Okay, so and then how often should I pray? Daily. Okay, so the bottom line is, can one pray all day? No. So therefore, what did our tradition suggest? Hmm? Specifying times, okay? Now, if I took specifying times, you said three times a day, why would I pray at night before I go to sleep? Uh, that's because, in, in the, I guess, in the Torah... No, 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 don't, go, don't give me Jewish sources yet. Take what we used. We're only, okay. We only know what we know right now. Right, you finish the day. And? And uh, whatever that happened throughout the day, you'd want to pray for that or something to you know, to be associated with the future. So it's either I'm going to be grateful that I got through the day and I'm not certain whether I'm going to have a day tomorrow. Okay. In the morning. You thank God for your life, so you're in appreciation. I got through the night. I'm alive, I'm breathing. And the middle of the day, theoretically, if it was the middle, it, we could conflate the day afternoon service and the evening service at the same time, separated by twilight or entering that period. Why the middle of the day? I think it helps to deal with the things that happen throughout the day. So what is it? The morning is state of appreciation or a state of need. 
a state, a state of aspiration or need or, or appreciation. The one at night, the same but the reverse, right? I go through the day and I'm thinking, what does the middle of the day say? It's almost like resetting maybe. Stop, look, and listen that I'm out on autopilot. I stop for a moment and say, I'm not a machine just functioning in the day. I'm stopping to take note of, for a few minutes, whatever that is. And it so happens that the service in the morning is the longest, the one in the evening is, is much shorter, and the one in the, the afternoon service is the shortest. But it's not less, a con less consequential conceptually, because morning and night are logical times, and the other is thoughtful time. I've got to take a minute from Goldman and go and see if there's a minion someplace, and there probably is in your building, where people are getting together to do that. So prayer is an opportunity to say that my life is reflective, not just um, instinctive or automatic. Okay? So according to that logic, I should be praying all day. But it's, like we said, it's not necessarily feasible. But I would say, and this is a takeaway for you, that one can live prayerfully, even if one does not structure the day the way I just divided into three periods. One can live prayerfully, which means to live with an acknowledgement of recognition of these life experiences and which we want to assign some kind of aspiration or meaning to them. All right? I just don't go through life without stopping to reflect about it. Now, if that's the case, and you want to introduce God into that, except for a moment that would for our understanding of God is that if I were to say something, I assume there's someone listening. Okay? I may not get the answer. I may not be able to communicate as well as I would like to. But I assume that I'm not going through a soliloquy. Just an imaginative exercise of things that I'm saying in my mind because it's cheaper than a psychologist or my mother. Okay? So the question is, how to express my feelings. If I were a musician and I wanted to express my feelings, what would I do? Hmm? Play music. Would I play music? music? I might write music. So what is the, what is the music? Words. Hmm? Words. Words or notes. Expression. But what is it? It's expression. Of what? Excellent. Great. Okay. Now, if I knew that what I'm going to play is going to be in Lincoln Center, or what I'm going to compose is going to be in Lincoln Center, I'd want to make certain that I didn't just get up there in Lincoln Center and pick up my violin, my viola, or schlep my uh, cello. Uh, I, I would want to make sure that what? Practice. So that I could convey that which is in my mind appropriately because I'm playing with other people. So we need score, a musical score, or we need a and we need a vocabulary, and we need a road map. So the first thing that you have in your hand here, the black book, called a what? Sidur. What does the word Sidur sound like? We're coming toward a holiday. Seder. What does a Seder mean? And you know what the word means? Order. order. Correct. So Seder says there's an order, as opposed to what's the opposite? Disorder. Disorder, which means chaos, no direction. Like I'm getting up and like I said, I'm just playing because I feel like I want to do it. And you'll all pay $300 to hear me play, right? So, not to pray, but to play. So I would have to have some kind of order in my life. And so this Siddur is a roadmap or provides an order. So let's open for a moment to the um, table of contents. Now, I just want to make one comment to you before we get into it. If you read a prayer, and we, look at, we may look at some today, there are different kinds of prayers, like there are different kinds of writing. Give me the hardest kind of writing to understand. What demands the most of you when you have to read something? Don't give me scientific formulas, because I'm not talking about that. But generally speaking, what would be difficult to read? Contracts. Contracts? Are you a lawyer? No. 
Okay, but it could be difficult to read a contract. What else could be difficult to read? Of, of the forms of writing. Something that you cannot relate to your everyday life. Okay, so it may be something in poetry, which may, if I had to read Chaucer's uh, Canterbury Tales, I'd have, or Shakespeare or in the original, I might have difficulty with the words because the words don't necessarily mean the same thing today they meant before. But Shakespeare's still around. Because when you get to it, the plot lines and the characters and the way it's played today have uh, still a resonance today. So the prayer book often has things that are biblical texts, which we're going to talk about. It has uh, Talmudic or, or texts. It has literary allusions. It has poetic things. And things which, we, which are calling upon other people's experience, which we don't have. So you have to study Beowulf. You have to study something else. You, have to, you can't read a scientific work of the 17th century without knowing what was going on in Galileo's time. The words don't mean the same thing. But that doesn't mean it's not worth reading. So we need a little understanding of what it is. So it doesn't mean that everything is going to be narrative and, po and, and, and prose. Some things are going to be poetic and difficult, but that doesn't mean they're not meaningful. It just it presupposes not only a feeling, but what else? To make it meaningful, what would it require? Your thoughts and applications, context. Context, what else? What else? Relevance. Relevance, what else? What's the metaphoric language it's drawing upon? What experiences exist to that? So that may be context to some extent, okay? Also vocabulary. So this is a, let's take a look at it. Um, Christina, give me yours and you'll share. So let's take a look. Just give me the categories. Um, Ilana, read. Rosh Hashanah. No, it's the first page. Oh. First page of the table of contents. Go to, so that's logical, correct? So this is a prayer book which is used for every day. Go ahead. Um, chakras for weekdays. That's the morning service. Blessings. Which are different blessings that commemorate different events, as you can see here. Because I want to say this, that <coughs> prayer, <coughs> there are different kinds of prayers. There could be blessings that are before events to make them meaningful. Uh, ceremonials like a bar mitzvah or a, or a circumcision or marriage or funeral or eating to take the action and to make it something which is more than just a mechanical, instinctive, animal act, okay? So we do that with food by cooking it, changing from animal to human. We do it with blessings to say, I have, I'm thinking of its purpose, not only its utility, not only its practical utility, but its ultimate purpose, okay? Next. Yeah, if there's a question, ask. No? Okay, go. Next. Link up for weekdays. Uh, that's the afternoon service. Ma for weekdays. That's the evening service. Eve of Sabbath and festivals. Okay. Next, go to the next page. Um, leave all that, because that's the same thing with the Saturday things. Go to page 636. Six, uh, what do you call it again? D don't turn the pages. Just go to in the table of contents. Uh, let's go to... The four species. Okay. So if you look... Uh, 644. Look with the number 644. Musaf of Rosh Kodesh. That's the, the beginning of a month. And then Pesach, Sukkot, Sukkot, so the holidays. Next page. Rosh Hashanah, Erev Yom Kippur. Hanukkah, Hanukkah Purim, Hanukkah. death and bereavement, special Sabbaths, Torah readings, and so forth. Okay? So with, this is a roadmap to your, to the, for the cycle of the calendar of the year. Okay? There should be something here to enable us to reflect on the meaning of those things, okay? Now, <coughs> okay, so that gives you a sense of what this book is, right? I want us to put it down for a moment. I want us to take a look at the architecture of what we've got here, to understand where we are. So, let's start with... Um, uh, why don't we start with you? Uh, you pick something. A central item that you think is a central item. Is that the tabernacle? Okay. So what are you looking at first? Um, I don't know. How, I, how high up are you? Ten Commandments. Okay, Ten Commandments. Okay? That is common in many synagogues, not all. But that's the first words of the Ten Commandments. Someone will say that all the commandments of Judaism, there are 613, that's a number which is used can all be subsumed under those ten categories. So it's not just ten commandments, it's ten categories. Okay? Uh, what's, what's next? What do you see right beneath it? What's the state? Yes, the description, I'll leave that. It says, know before whom you stand. 
which really should be the other way. So when the rabbi speaks, he should know before whom he speaks. But we'll leave that for a moment. Okay, next, what do you see? What's different up there? Okay, le- now I'm not talking about the physical, light. Uh, the light. What color is it? Red. The light is not, doesn't have to be red, but what's that called? Anyone know? Has a name. In Hebrew, it's called ner tamid. Ner is a candle or a light, and a tam- like ner Hanukkah. And uh, tamid means ongoing or eternal. It's called the eternal light. Why do you think it's called eternal light? It never goes out. Now, we know the bulb can go out, but what it means when all the other lights are out, that's going to stay on. Why do you think so? Suggest. To life. Like it represents life. Okay. And life. And what else? Our, our journey. Our journey. Good. What else? Continuous meaning. Hmm? It represents continuous meaning. Okay. Continuity. Continuous meaning. Or maybe God's presence. Okay. So that light stays on when all the lights go out. All synagogues have that in one way or another. Okay? What I want to look for is the things that are present in every synagogue. Okay? More or less. Um, okay. Um, let's look here. What do you see here? A menorah. Okay. Interesting. How many lights are there? Six. As opposed to? Eight. Nine. Which means it's not a... But where is this from? How, did it, we, how do we know that we should have six? Six days. Hmm? Six days. Six days a week is good, but the answer is interesting, but that's not the one I'm looking for, so I'll try another. In the Bible, it says that in the temple in Jerusalem, which was destroyed twice, once by the Babylonians in 586, before the common era, and the second by the Romans in 70 of the common era, uh, the temple was destroyed. One of the... Uh, uh, dominant items was a candelabra and it had six lights. Some people would say representing six branches of wisdom in the middle. This one says Zion or Zion. Others say other things. That represents Torah in the middle. So the other represents the outside six represent the different disciplines science, astronomy, whatever the, the, the forms were. And it's all taught Torah. So it's one whole in which all all the knowledge that human beings have from God and from their own experience is incorporated in the menorah, okay? The Hanukkah menorah is a different one that commemorates Hanukkah, which was an eight day. We'll talk about that the next time we meet in our home, but eight is different. This was a, this was a standard menorah, okay? Okay. Um, next. Uh, there are two flags, an Israeli flag and an American flag. That's not standard equipment. Some synagogues have them, some don't. But it reflects a commitment to the country in which we live, and our ancestral home. Okay? But it's not uncommon to have them, but not uniformly will they be there. What's on the wall? Aside from my wife's grandfather that's in the middle. Great-grandfather. Plaques commemorating people who have passed? Yes. They're called memorial tablets. Sometimes they're outside, sometimes they're in. For people that have passed. Now, why are they here? And first of all, why are the lights on? Some lights on and some off. Yartzeit. It means the, what does Yartzeit mean? Um, it, commemorating the anniversary of the person's death. Correct. So that day or that month, in most synagogues, of their passing, they, the light will be uh, illuminated. And the question and on Yom Kippur, and four times a year at the end of each holiday, Yom Kippur and three others, all lights will be kindled there. Now, where do you think my wife sits in the synagogue? Take a guess. On this side, on here? Yes, on that side, where? Beneath her grand grandfather. Yes, it? and her grandmother and eight other members of the family that are there. So, why is she doing that? To be close to them, in a way. So they can be close to her. Yeah. So that there's a feeling that on holidays, that one is not here as an individual alone, but there's a rootedness, there's a family connection. And if you're fortunate enough to be in a synagogue where one had relatives of previous generations, one can feel that. And if one does not, 
that at least they can feel that there were people here before them. Life didn't begin with them. We're a people of memory. The only people to whom memory is not significant is people who have Alzheimer's or people who have amnesia. They don't know where they came from. They don't know who belonged to them and whom they belong to, even though genetically they know they didn't come from nothing. So there's a continuity of that. And that's also in many synagogues. And on the anniversary of the passing of the person, prayers are recited and so forth, okay? Now, it may be that people pay to have those plaques there. That's true. And it supports the institution. But more emotional connection is invested than the stone that's there, okay? Okay, let's move on to um, other things that are here. What else do you see here? The ark. Uh, every synagogue will have an ark. What's in there? The Torah. What do we do with the Torah? Fundamentally, basically. We read it. So two things go on in a synagogue. Well, three. One, it's a place where people gather, so it's called the house of assembly. Second, it's a place where people, fundamentally, Pray. it's a house of prayer. And that's where human beings speak to God. Also to each other a lot, we know that. But it's a place where they pray to, where God, they, we, they talk, people speak or communicate with God. And what happens in the Torah, to use the formulation I just used? We do not speak to God, but speaks to God speaks to us. So what, prayer is a form of, of expression, conversation. prayer, conversation, and communication. But it's not only a place where people gather, called the house of assembly. It's not only a place where people pray, which is called the house of prayer, but it's also a house of study. So we have a second volume here, which you have. You can hold one up. And this is a, a printed text of the Torah, which is there, correct? And where do you think it's read from in this synagogue? The Bima, which is up there. There's a table behind that, and some synagogues in the middle. Sometimes it's elevated, sometimes it's where it is here. Uh, and what is this desk here? What do you think? It's where the rabbi would address the congregation if he wanted to do that. In the service, there's a, sometimes where he teaches, speaks, it would be from here. Okay? The chairs are for anybody that are there. Usually the rabbi sits there so he can watch whatever he's doing. No. He's there because people say there's a leader here. That's the sense. Okay? Now, uh, this book, which is called what? <coughs> Who said? Chumash, meaning the word f a fifth, because there are five books of Moses. And this one is just the second book, which is here, which we completed this past week. And in this text, which you can look for a moment, as you probably have looked at already before, this is a Hebrew text. There is an Aramaic translation, which we don't know Aramaic unless you're living someplace near Persia, or you study it. And then there is a commentary on the side in Hebrew and in English. So the text is read, and people follow it along here. In the same way, when a service is going on, there may be someone leading the service. He may be a professional called a chazan or a cantor, or it could be any lay person. Okay. So you don't need a rabbi or a professional person to have a public service. You just need people who know something and are ready to do it, okay? Because Judaism is not clerically run, as you might say Christianity, a priest would have to officiate it or something, a minister. That's not true in Judaism, okay? It's much more democratic in that sense. It comes from the people, okay? Now, <clears throat> I just want to ask you one thing. How many of you know Hebrew? How many of you know Hebrew prayers? <clears throat> Some of them. I would say everybody here knows one prayer. Everybody. How many of you agree with me? Okay. Right, you disagree. I'm going to say two words, and I want you to finish the sentence. Okay? Shema Yisrael. Eh. Echad. Now, many knew that because 
And in English, can anyone translate it? Here are Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Uh, most people would know, many people would know that. So how many of you knew it? Raise your hands. Or after I said, after we sang it, raise your hands. I want to just see because I want to know who doing it. How many did not? Okay. Okay. That's a generational change. In your parents' generation, I don't think the, the numbers would have been the same. So it says that I can't or you cannot rely on your background entirely for this subject, but it's something you have to explore if you want to know what it's about. And that takes effort. And the goal today is to at least open it up as a possibility. Okay? All right. What I want you to do is to... Why'd you take my prayer book? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I want to I want, I want that. I want that. I want that. I want you to turn to page... Page 432. Okay, Yolanda, you got it back. Thank you. Okay, 432. Now, in the service, and I'll give you things about times at the end, let's assume that a service started at 9. Around 10 o'clock is going to be the Torah reading. Torah reading could take between 20 and 30 minutes generally, if it's efficiently done. Now, people are called up to recite a blessing over the Torah, which you'll find on page 432. But don't lose this page. We'll get there. Or maybe we'll do it up there. They're called up to, to where someone will read the section of the Torah, although theoretically the person called up could read it too, but they're probably not prepared, so they will not. Someone will read a section of the Torah, and the person being called up will recite certain blessings. Okay? Now, if you went to the synagogue, the minimum number of people called to, to recite these blessings on Saturday, uh, during the week, would be three. Try to take a good guess. On, when it's a holiday like the beginning of the new month, how many think it's a weekday when people are in a rush? How many would be called up? It's not a regular day. It's a little bit more than that, so take a guess. Four. Uh, if, it's, if it's a holiday like Passover and Sukkot and Shavuot, how many? Five. Great. If it's Yom Kippur, how many? Six. Six. And if it's the Shabbat? Seven. Seven. So each day, as it increases in its sanctity, is acknowledged by the number of people that are called up. So if I know that three people are being called up, I know it's a? If I know that five are being called up, I know it's a? If I know seven are called up? At least seven? Okay, so that's, the, that's what it is, okay? So people should have a sense of the Torah the different days of the week, okay? So Saturday afternoon, which is the end of the day, three people are called up like a weekday, okay? But at the beginning of the month, four, holiday, Pesach, Sukkot, and Shavuos, five, Yom Kippur, Six. Saturday minimum, seven. seven, okay. But since people are not doing so much, so much afterwards, you can call it more than seven as well, okay? Now what I want us to do is to take the prayer book, Turn to what page are we up to? 432. 432. All right, let me get it. And I want us to uh, come up where we're going here. Okay? So everybody, everybody come up. Four thirty two. So we know about a prayer book now, right? And we know about a chumash. This is called a prayer book in Hebrew is called a what? Sidur, like the word? Cedar. And this is called a chumash, because it's the Hebrew word chumash, five, five books of Moses, correct? What's this called? Talis. Okay. A talit or a talis, depending if you're speaking in Israeli Hebrew or you're speaking Ashkenazic Hebrew. And if someone, let's say you came here on a Saturday morning, I wouldn't want you to wear this. You know why? Because if they did, someone is going to assume in an Ashkenazic synagogue that you are what? And he's not. No. Next stage. Married? You're right. They can assume he's married. Oh. So if you're not wearing one, you know he's still eligible. Okay? So Saturday morning, you come to the synagogue, you're going to sit next to me. You're going to put this on? No. 
Absolutely not. Okay. But if you went to uh, some synagogues, maybe everyone would wear it so they don't know. Okay. So those are 90 years old are sitting there. Maybe single, maybe it's not. You take a look and you'll see. In Ashkenazi synagogues? In Ashkenazi synagogues, correct. In Sephardic synagogues, they wear them. Always. Yes. Okay. By, after Bar Mitzvah. And some earlier too. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're going to give you a job. Okay. Uh oh. Are you worried, huh? You're nervous, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know why you know? I'll tell you why you should, you should not be nervous, but I'll tell you why you should. Why, why are you nervous? Tell me why. Because I don't speak Hebrew. Who said I'm going to ask you to do anything in Hebrew? <laughs> Be more basic. Why, why else? He didn't know because he doesn't know what he's going to have to do. Right. So sometimes someone says, I want to honor, honor you. Go up in New York. What are you going to say? No, no thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Where are you going to put your head? Down. Which seat are you going to be in? The back. I don't want to be recognized. Now, do you know anyone who doesn't want to be recognized in life? Only he wants to, doesn't want to be recognized. You want to be recognized other than that? Yeah. You want them to know who you are? Yeah. Absolutely. But not with this, right? Well, because you're not comfortable. Because right. you feel like an outsider. And not a insider. And after tonight, how are you going to feel? Insider. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> so the, so the, so the, come up here. What is this? I'm trying to. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. So the, 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 the talus, sometimes different colors, not consequential. Mm -hmm. These fringes represent the commandments in the Bible, so the combination of the knots and turns and strings is 613, which represents the number of, of injunctions in the Torah. Okay? Okay. Now, if you were not wearing a talus and we called you up, then you would say, would you like an honor to open the ark? What are you going to answer? No, thanks. That's what you used to answer. What are you going to answer now? Yes. Certainly. So you're going to put on a talus because if you're going to open the ark or you're going to take out the Torah, you, this is what you will do as a sign of? Respect. Excellent, great. It's like putting on a tie if you went to see Obama. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. uh, no, if you, if you would have gone to see uh, what's his name Romney, you would have worn a tie or, or, or jeans would get your hair done. Anyway, so you're wearing this talus, correct? Yes. Okay. A talus, and someone's going to ask you to come up here. Now you don't know what's going on, right? right. So probably someone is going to tell you what to do. Like they'll tell you. Go, go there, and you're going to say, but it's here. You're going to be all confused. But you have, to, you have to believe the guy. You have some faith. That's your faith. Not a God, but the guy's going to tell you what to do. Okay? Now, we will look at page, uh, on the bottom of, of the paragraph, on page uh, 433. What does it say? Who's reading? Uh, no, I'm not going to bother. Should I bother you to read? Are you sure? I'll read. Okay. The bottom here? Yes. Do good with Zion. No, wait, wait, wait. Oh, here. From when the ark, wait, read the instruction. The ark is? When, when the ark is open, we declare. When the ark, or the ark is open? When Not quite the bottom. When. Where, where's the instruction? Oh, here. Yeah. When the ark would travel, yes. Moses would say, Arise, Hashem, and let your foes be scattered. Let those who hate you flee from you. For from Zion the Torah will come forth, and the word of Hashem from Jerusalem. Blessed is he who gave the Torah to his people. Israel. So look at all the images there. Who's the main character there? The ark from Moses. No. Moses. Oh. And he's telling you when the ark would travel, because they had a portable ark traveling in the desert after they left Egypt before they got to Israel. Okay? So the portable ark is there. And you doing okay so far? So far I'm okay. Good, okay, fine. Okay. <laughs> um, and from Zion the Torah shall come forth, meaning what is Zion? Where? Israel. Ultimately Israel, and like that's why the word Zion is in the middle of the, of the candelabra of the menorah, correct, okay? And it says, your enemies should be scattered, and, and, and Hashem is the name, for, meaning the name, meaning God. Okay, blessed is he who gave the Torah to Israel. So what are we going to do now? We're going to open the, uh, we're going to open the, the ark, okay? You're not going to do that. You're just going to stand here and look okay. handsome, <laughs> okay? Uh, he's, got, he's not doing anything. Come on. Anyone who sits in the back is doomed. <laughs> okay. Now, when the ark opens, what do you think people are going to do? What you're doing right now? Yeah. Stand. Why? Because it's a sign of respect. The Torah is going to be taken out, and generally it will be walked either through the entire congregation, or here they just go down and then come back up. Okay? The idea is that the Torah belongs not up here, but it belongs the with the people. Okay? Okay. So, okay, you ready? Okay. Okay. So go do it. Oh, so someone would have to tell you, right? So each one would be different. Generally, it would say, okay, you can put this down now. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Now, there was a, was, was there a, sometimes there are words on here and something is just a flame. What is it, close again, I want to see what it says. I think I am here every week, but I don't remember. It says, Eitz Chaim, which, anyone know what it means? 
Eitz Chayim, what does it mean? Anyone know what Eitz means? Julie, where are you? Eitz is land or sun. <laughs> what does it know? Eitz is a tree, and Chayim is life, right? So it's a tree of life. So the Torah is a tree of life for those who hold on to it, meaning it sustains you. Okay? Eitz Chayim He, which is in the song we'll see it, we'll see at the end, okay? It's a quotation from the Psalms. Open. You did a good job, now you can do it a second time. Okay? Um, now go ahead. Keep going. No, that's finished. Go ahead. What do you think? I don't know. Go ahead. I've seen it. Open. Push it? I no, don't know. pull. Go up, go, go up a step. Go ahead. Open. Oh. Okay. Okay, now generally that's open before the service starts, so people shouldn't say that I eat my breakfast today. Okay? Now, I got a problem. First of all, there are many Torahs. Why is that so? Because people may have contributed different Torahs at different times, so, or they may own them and they pre keep them in the synagogue in different places. And why are there more than one? Every synagogue will have minimum three, because in some services, they will use three on a holiday. So one may be rolled to the beginning of the scroll, doesn't mean the end of the scroll, and it would take an hour to re-roll it, so you're prepared to the section you're going to read, okay? Now I know we're gonna use this one today because I saw it prepared, but normally, oh yeah, here it is. It will have this in it, or the name, or the week we're gonna read it. it what is, we're gonna read is in here, inserted here, a little, a little tab. There are different designs, but many of them are in common. Some have words on them, some do not. It's, it's, not um, it's only stylistic. It's not a question of any reason. Don't go away, stay here. So there are many Torahs here, and sometimes on one holiday called Simcha Torah, they read in many different places in the building because everybody gets a chance to be called to the Torah. So they use all of them, and they have readers in different places. Okay, then either the person who's called up or opens the ark will, um, will take it out, or someone will hand it to the person. So you're coming here. Yeah, you. I am taking it out. You're going to hold it against your chest with one hand in the middle. Okay? Are you comfortable with it now? Okay. Now come out. Scared out of my mind. <laughs> no, you know, if you drop it, we'll kill you. <laughs> or, or God will take care of you. I don't have to do it. So let's close the curtain. God will take care of you? Is that what you said? No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Anyway, so usually you will take it out and you will hand it to a rabbi or the cantor or the one leading the service and they will come up here, okay? Then there are, uh, you don't have any reading part right now, you're just gonna stand there. And the next page, skip to page uh, 436. And if you look in the middle, what do you see on 436? What's the central line? Torah is removed from the ark. Go ahead. And presented to the Hazan who accepts it in his right arm facing the congregation. The Which Hazan is what? Raises the Torah, followed by the congregation, recites, Hear, O Israel, Hashem is our God, Hashem the one and only. And what's that in Hebrew? Shema. Shema. Yisrael <laughs> Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Okay, then what will happen is the one who opened the ark generally will follow this person around with other people who are seated up here, maybe the president or, or, or someone who's involved who's going to read the service, and they're going to go down and they're going to come back. But we're not going to do that right now. So now we see these are here, these are ornaments. Now first of all, when he walks around, what are you going to hear? Jingle. Bells. So what is that going to tell people? That he's coming. is here, so pay attention. Okay. Then, before you're going to put it down, what someone is going to do is going to, they're going to remove this. And put it down someplace. And interesting, if you look at this breastplate, what does it resemble? Quickly, what do you see? What else in the synagogue does it look like? Right, so many of them will cover this. You'll see the crown, like a crown of the Torah, which means that's our royalty. Okay, you will see the... What's here? Ten commandments. Ten commandments. And you will see other kinds of things. It's just natural design, normal design. Um, hmm? It's not, you're not, not too heavy if you are. No. Opposite one's heart. Okay. Uh, do me a favor. Someone put on a chair. Thank you. 
That was just to make you relax. Yeah. It helped. There's no significance to that. Okay, it, it, okay. Now, we're going to put it down. This way. This way. Come in front. No, the other way. That's the top. Okay. So you're going to put it down. Okay? Okay. Now, go on the other side. I want to take the cover off. So what I'm going to do is, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it down halfway, and you're going to take the cover off. Okay? And then you're going to put the someplace. And they're going to be someone standing here. You're going to stand here. You're going to stand here. A Torah reader is going to stand here. You're going to call someone up to recite a blessing. Someone's going to come over and tell you what the name of the person is you should call up. And you say, uh, Samuel, the son of, 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 of Shimon, uh, for the first Aliyah, for the first elevation of Torah, you're going to be the Torah reader. I'm going to come up and get a blessing, and you're standing here, okay? After I read the blessing, I'm going to stand here while the next person comes gets a blessing. So it's not like I run away because now I'm, not, I'm scared. Because <laughs> I'm not scared anymore because I did my blessings. The blessings are there. We're not going to go through the blessings now, but they're there. Believe me, they're there. You want to read them now? No. Okay, good. <laughs> so uh, after, you, after, after you read it, you're going to stand here, and the next person is going to get up, and the next person is going to recite a blessing. And then after you recite, the, if you, if, now I'm finished, right? So I'm going to go over there to the president, and he's going to say, how are you doing? Fine. Don't get nervous. And then I'm going to walk down. I walk up this way on the right, and I'm going to walk around and go down to the left. Why don't I go down the way I came? We're still coming up. Hmm? Make the circle still coming up. Because I want to go away slowly and the long way. I want to go up the short way. So I always, some people go up on that side, but they should go down the other way. If they come up this way, they should go down the other way. So it shows I'm <laughs> eager to get there, and I'm not eager to leave. Right, because now I'm an... Insider. Right. <laughs> That's the whole point, okay? <laughs> now, okay, the Torah is written by hand, okay? And they're not, it's written by hand by a person who, when he writes each and every letter, has to think that he's doing it for the purpose of, a holy purpose in writing uh, the, the word of God in this book. If he's thinking about whether the Knicks are going to make the playoffs or not, it's not going to make it. And so even though it's everything written perfectly and it looks great and all that, it's not a kosher scroll. So it has to be a person we know knows the rules, someone who is pious and undertakes to do that, and we assume that's what he's going to think about. So is it usually a rabbi or someone? Someone who's been trained in calligraphy, and knows the meaning of the text and the words. Okay? So there are different styles, those don't look the same, or it'll look the same to you, but someone who's gonna look more will see someone who has a more refined script. But the basic words are the same and the same number of words in each text. How okay? long does it take to write? A year if one is good. So someone who is writing a Torah, how much should a Torah cost? What do you think it should cost? Just guess now based on what you asked me. Thousand dollars. What are you are you fed intravenously? <laughs> Probably in the range of, of fifty to seventy thousand dollars. If one were to use one, it would be less, which mean it may not be as beautiful. It may not be as new. It would be an old scroll. Maybe it requires uh, something to repair it. And you can come closer so you can see everybody. So it's written by hand, it, uh, usually a year. A mezuzah would take a day or half a day or less than that. They could write many a day. Tefillin, which has parchment inside it, uh, that's the things that people put on their arms. In there, it would take less time to write. So. It's probably about a year, and if it was really good, I would say probably today, probably forty, fifty thousand dollars, because that's what a person needs to live. It's it's based upon just how much he can do and how well. And you don't want someone who is going to write too quickly, okay? So it's not about economics; it's about holiness and commitment and compensation. Okay. What I want to do today is really inspire you, but demystify it. You know, I don't want it to leave it in ways which oh, he must be a he's a, he's a Jew who's committed and, and wants to do this, okay? Now, this is what the text looks like. It's written with a quill, and it's written with, Christina, come up here. Okay. Uh, and it's written with a quill and with ink, and it's not inside the text. It's not inside the scroll. Come over here, come on. You've been away too long in Russia, get over here. <laughs> and, um, thank you. And it's written on top, so that the, it's not inside the, the parchment, it's from the parchment of a kosher animal, like a, a cow or a goat or a sheep, okay? And it's, of course, cleaned up to do this. And then there were lines put in here uh, with, a, with a metal sort of quill, or maybe just a quill, not metal. And he was written on top. Now, because it was written this way and it's subject to humidity and all kinds of things, it's possible that a letter can rub out. 
or just jump off the page. So if someone sees a mistake, sometimes they'll take another one out and correct it, and someone will go over and look and see if the letter still resembles a full letter. Now, all these texts are the same. I mean, all the columns are the same, except the one column that I opened up to. <clears throat> this is the story in the book of Exodus. When the Jews left, the, left Egypt, they went to the desert, and what happened to them when they got out of the Egypt? What was the biggest challenge they had right away? You're going to read about it during Passover? They had to, the, 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 the sea. They had to cross the Red Sea, and they, it, the water was in front of them, and the question is, the Egyptians were pursuing in the back, and the water was in front of them, and according to our tradition, the, the water's strong wind came, and the, part is, and, the, and the water's parted. Now tell me where that is in this graphic presentation. Somewhere where there's lots. I don't know. So what do you see? Tell me what you see here. Tell me the word picture. Parting. What's are spreading out. So what do you see here? These are the two pillars of water, mm -hmm. the two walls of Torah. And what do you see? Uh, 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 two, the pillars of water. Wow. And what do you see here? The path of people. path where the people are going through. So this is a way, this song, this is the song that Moses sang. It's in the prayer book. I can, if you remind me later, I'll show you the page. This is the song they sang after the water split. So it's only two sections in the Torah like that. That's why I chose this. But it's rather dramatic. Okay? Now, the Torah is read. Everyone recited their blessings. Finished. Okay? Now we have to do something else. Is there another tally here? Yeah. It's Can I have it? How could anyone drop anything? <laughs> only me. I. Okay, so whether it's a longer one or a shorter one, it just should basically cover the body and not be a scarf around one's neck. If you go to a synagogue, everyone goes, here, yeah, yeah. it's a little uncomfortable. But if you know what you're doing, the way he's wearing is quite comfortable, but if you had the same idea, it's going to fall off. Okay, so people are always doing this, but fits, okay? It shouldn't look like a scarf, like you're going outside with you because it's snowing, okay? Now, it should cover basically your body so you feel enwrapped in it in one way or another. Now what happens is we finished. So the Torah has to be elevated and shown to the people. And there's a phrase in the text which says, this is the Torah which sometimes prayers are recited for people that are ill here too. What page are we supposed to be? 445. 445, correct. What does it say? Read it. This is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel upon the command of Hashem through Moses' hand. Okay, so Moses was at Sinai. He, had, uh, he went there for three semesters, 40 days each, came back, and for 40 years afterwards, he recorded his notes, the same way those of you who are smart enough to take notes this morning will say that the notes are not what I said, but what are the notes? What, what you think. What I think the person said, and then God gave approval. So basically, there were Moses' notes at Sinai, which he recorded afterwards, okay? Because he didn't have a book at Sinai, probably. He just wrote it down afterwards, okay? So this is like, if, for example, let's say in the Torah it says, thou shalt not murder. Usually, I would say, it, it does not say, thou shalt not kill. That's what everyone will say. It says, thou shalt not murder. What's the difference between killing and murdering? Killing is taking of a life. Murder is taking a life illegally. Give me an example when I could take a life when it's not illegal. A car accident. Okay, that's an accident. What else? Self-defense, correct. So the word says, thou shalt not murder. But obviously, it couldn't all be written here, all these, who's the lawyer here? You couldn't write all the cases of negligence or, 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 or deliberately killing someone and so forth, or collateral damage, all these things. So the words are just here, but from that, there was a whole tradition of study. And that's what we study in the Humash, the other books, and other books, okay? Then what would happen is, the, 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 our, the, someone would be called up, could be you, but not right away. And the first thing is, oh, okay, it's heavy. And how am I going to do it? So the way to do it is the same way we put it down. If you'll just look at what I'm going to do. I lifted it by putting it halfway down on the desk. I will turn around this way so people here can see. Over here, people are going to read that phrase. And then someone is going to fold these together. But I'm going to just put it down now. As normally, they would fold it on the seam so it doesn't tear. And someone will walk to a chair there. And then someone will put this on. Not all of them are Velcro. Some of them are... are um, uh, not Velcro, what do you call it? Uh, yeah, uh, what? Buckles, clasps, yeah. Why, why do we not make knots here? Because the next guy would have to open it would go crazy. He'd be very, very embarrassed, right? Where's the, where's the cover? 
You can do it, Julie. You're, 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 I, come over here and do it. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. We have a we have free choice here. Should've, to do should, or not to do. Everyone has to do what they're asking. <laughs> Just, no, only here. Okay. Okay. Is it in? Uh, I think so. This is, by the way, exactly what happens when you do it for the first time. <laughs> it's okay. Go. I've done it for the first time. Good. Great. Okay. Next, what's coming next? The breastplate. The reason for adorning it is just our, our own expression of identification that because something is beautiful. Like earrings or... Okay, next. Um, open the arc. Look how good she is now. <laughs> okay. 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 Now, yeah, the, oh yeah, take, yeah, take one off. This one, the other one. Put it on. And they use this, by the way, it's called the yad or a hand, so that the person can see where they're reading and not lose their place. Some people use it, some people don't, okay? Now that when it's returned, people are standing. They may, if the Torah is there, they're wearing a prayer, if they're wearing, not if you're wearing a prayer book. If you're wearing a talus or if you're holding a prayer book, and the Torah passes by, you might put it to it, and kiss it, okay? I just want to comment that women, if they are menstruating, they have their periods and so forth, there's no restriction on them touching the Torah at any time. Uh, so they could touch it, doesn't make any difference, okay? That's not being unclean, it's a state of the loss through ovulation and so forth and, and the passage from one's body, which is not a living experience because it's something which was not fulfilled to become a person, but it, it no way implies anything which is unclean and so forth, even if there is a cycle going on. Okay, so you should know that. Okay, next. Uh, I'll, I'll do it because I, you want me to do it? Close these? Okay. Okay, now I can finish. Is there always a light on inside the ark? There is usually a light on in the ark, yeah. And it stays on always. Usually stays on. Maybe when you open the doors, I don't know. It's not the same as the eternal light, but it's there. Okay? And from here, so that sometimes the Torah reading desk will be facing the other direction, sometimes here, sometimes in the middle, it depends on the construction. Synagogues built in America till in the early 20s were built on the Protestant model, unfortunately. Really? Yeah, because that's how churches were built. That's how they built synagogues. So that, that reading desk was here and the Torah reading desk was here, maybe it faced the other way. But ideally, where should it be? Ideally? In the middle. In the middle, because the Torah is among the people. But the construction would be different. Maybe the space didn't allow for it. But the Christianization, I would say, Protestantization of synagogues occurred at that time. So are modern synagogues built differently? If they know enough, think about it, or they're sensitive to that analysis. But most people are not. They just say, that's how I found it. There's a reading that's facing the people here and there, and we're just removed from it. So as a result, people feel distant, and they should not. So the idea is how do you create intimacy and feeling of community, as opposed to this, which is not done well. Now, we talked. We'd like them to talk about putting it in the middle, but you'd lose 30 seats. So could you do it this way? Yes, but I'm saying it's the privatization because Jewish services should not have been built this way. Okay? Okay, we're going to go back down now. Thank you very much. Um, what's the value of set prayers? If I had a few minutes to spend with the president, I'd want to make sure that I didn't want to go up there and just say what I wanted to say. I'd want to make sure that I prepared it. That's called fixed prayers. Okay? What's the disadvantage of that? Automatically. Hmm? Automatically, it's not spontaneous. Prayer, and this, this is meant to be a guide, not a straitjacket. Okay? So there's room in all our services for individual prayers and to say what you want to say. And it's important when you come to the synagogue not to become a robot. I'll give you an example of being a robot. The congregation will rise because on, turn to page 27 and don't do this. Turn to page 27 and rise. So what do you do? You rise. Uh, congregation is now seated. What do you do? Yes, now, you are a puppet. Now, if you're standing out of respect because that's what you're doing, it's okay. But you don't have to be on the same page where everybody is up to. That's a general rule. You could be in the section where they're up to, but you don't have to say, now we're on page 46, now we're on page 47, and just like a robot, it doesn't mean anything. You can read as you'd like. You're not on trial here in any synagogue. So you, you stand out of respect, stand where people are doing it, okay, but it doesn't mean you have to be locked in. 
And the day you are, the, the, there's certain places in the service where one could add their own prayers. Or you can think about what you want to think about. Okay? Or you can bring a card and say, I want to think about this when I'm here. Or you may want to study one section with a commentary, because you see it's taken from the book of Exodus. You may want to study the book of Exodus and you have a book there, you can go there. So, especially when you're at the beginning stages, don't get locked in. Okay? If it's a short service, okay. But if it's longer, the idea is to be a participant, but not co-opted. Okay? Now, so I'd say prayers have, the best kind of prayers are those that are fixed and spontaneous as opposed to either or. Fixed gives me a good score, a good text, okay? Spontaneous gives me my own feelings, and we should have both. Or think freely, and not just be married to the text. I believe in marriage, but not to that, not to that extent. Prayers, and you notice in this book, and many books, are in Hebrew, English, and some prayers, books, books are even transliterated, meaning Hebrew prayers written in English letters, like Shema Yisrael, could be written in English letters, and you might feel more comfortable with that because you're not reading Hebrew, but you may want to sing it with people when they're singing. So there are some supplementary things that could, can help along the way till you read Hebrew, okay? Now, what's the advantage of having texts in Hebrew? It keeps the real word and the meaning. Hmm? So you feel closer to the time when it was there, okay? Was, what else? It doesn't, sometimes through, through translation you lose the meaning. Someone once said that reading our prayers in translation is, is like kissing a bride through the veil. It's not quite the same thing. Yeah. On the other hand, if I don't know the Hebrew, then the English is very helpful and it's okay. God understands all languages. So legally, it's, you, you can say everything in any language you want, even Russian. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I think that Putin might be able to have an objection, mm -hmm. but you could do it. It's not a question. You can use all languages. The advantage of Hebrew is one, it has a certain tradition. What else? If I go to a synagogue in Moscow it's or universal. in St. Petersburg or I go to Spain or I go to Argentina, universal. I should be able to feel pretty much at home. The melodies may be different, but the text should be pretty much the same. There'll be some additions here and there, but it should give a universality to it. History and universality. Third, also, some of it is poetic. So if I read it in, in English, I'm reading things which don't seem to make much sense. But if I studied it, and then did it, it may make more meaning. God is like the rushing waters. Is God like rushing waters? The, to the poet, it was. It means some kind of surge, or, or you know, uh, and, and, and language could mean more metaphorically because it's not all, the pro, sections that are prose are beautiful. Those that are poetry are complicated. But since we said prayer is a form of study and study is a form of prayer, we try to combine the two, okay? So a prayer book is not just for prayer, it's also for study. That's why I said you don't have to be on the same page. You could look at other pages, because it's a learning exercise. I'm in the right ballpark. I don't have to be on the same page. Okay, not everyone has to be in the same position. So that's the advantage of Hebrew, okay? Now, um, so stay at your own pace. Okay. How do you feel at home in a place? Let me start with this. Service is 9 o'clock till 12 o'clock, let's say Saturday morning, usually 9 to 11.30. Many places could be 9.30 to 12. Let's use that frame, Saturday morning. Saturday morning is the main service, even though many of you may think that Friday night was a major service because when people were working in the 1920s, they tried, not too many people came Saturday morning, and we've carried on that thing for 80 years later. People don't have to go Saturday morning. But the key service is Saturday morning when the Torah reading is there and it's theoretically we're not working and we have time and we're relaxed and we can participate. So there's service every day of the week, but Saturday morning is generally the largest number. If it's, let's say, this is the time frame 9 to 12 just for analysis, okay? When should you come? Anytime you can, but What do you think? Nine. Come at 9 to 12. Well, I don't think so. Why not? Why should you not come 9 o'clock to 12? Be practical. You're not going to be asleep. Hmm? What do you think? I don't know what you were saying before. Up there, not to be the same as everyone. Okay, what else? Why should you not come 9 o'clock? Hmm. What do you think? Be practical. Working. No, if you're, not, you're off that day. I'd be, I'd be half asleep. I wouldn't be awake. Paying it's long. <laughs> it's long, and if you don't have the background, it's going to be too long. Okay? The only people who come 9 o'clock when it says 9 o'clock is if non-Jews are invited to a bar mitzvah and the invitation is at 9 o'clock, they come 9 o'clock, but none of the Jews are here. <laughs> I've had that experience, so that's, that's the truth. 
It happened when I was a rabbi in a synagogue. Someone got up to say Kaddish, the memorial prayer in the morning. No one answered him. Why not? Because no one was Jewish except the guy saying, everyone else, they don't come till 10 o'clock. So Jews know, don't come on time. So <laughs> 9 o'clock is too early because it's too long. I come 9 o'clock because I know what's going on and I'd rather be there, but I wouldn't suggest you come 9 o'clock. Don't come 11 o'clock because I say I'm coming to eat, I'm coming to meet girls or guys. That's not the time to do it. So if I had to choose a time, I would say come around 10 o'clock because what do you think is going to happen around 10 o'clock? The Torah reading is going to be there, so you have it. The, the Chumash you can study. The rabbi will probably speak. The message should be intelligible, and it's going to be in English. And the Musaf service, which is the last part of the service, is generally not too long and usually sung a lot. So I'd say come 10 o'clock. The question is where to sit. Now, I know what seat you would choose. Uh, what seat are you going to choose? Absolutely, the back seat. <laughs> not a good seat. Give me another not good seat. Front row. Front row, because he'll tell you why. Wow. So what's a good seat? Maybe, maybe. Let me tell you what a good seat is. On the side. Hmm? On the side. I'll tell you what a good seat is. Good seat. I come 10 o'clock because I know what's going to go on, right? Pretty much. It could be 10 to 10. I could be 20 to 10. Not 11, but somewhere in that time frame. <clears throat> and I'm going to take a sidur and I'm going to take a chumash. Okay? I'm not going to take a... Because I'm not married, correct? And... I'm going to come in and I, I'm going to say to the person in the back who's going to probably greet me, say, hi, what's your name? Matt. Hi. And you know what Matt's going to say? Well, I'll be, I'll be uh, Robert, okay? You're the greeter. What are you going to say? Hi, Robert. And what else is he going to say if it's Saturday morning? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom, right? Well, welcome to our synagogue. And um, what else are you going to say to me? Um, take a... A siddur and a chumash, okay? And uh, what else might you say to me? Um, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, okay. You know, I'll tell you, let me tell you something. What's your name? Matt. Matt. You know, I've never been to a synagogue before. Okay. Or not in many years. Right. I mean, I was, but I really, I didn't know what's going on here. <laughs> Do you know anyone that I could sit next to who could show me what's going on, who would welcome, welcome it? And, you know, not feel that I'm imposing on him, but I, I'd, I'd feel more comfortable. And what would you say? <laughs> Not because you're greeting everybody, but what you would say if you did your job well and if you were trained well, you would say, go sit next to Rabbi Hurt in the middle, you know, I'll take you to him because he, he, he's used to crazy guys, no, he's used to, he's used to people coming and, and he'd be happy to sit next to you because he already came over to me some weeks and said, you know, if we have a guest, is that okay if I ring him over? He would sit there, we could say, hi, how are you, what do you do, and let me tell you what's going on with the service and you would feel very comfortable then. So what's a good seat? Next to the rabbi. Ne no. Next to anyone who is knowledgeable. And so you come and say, I'd like to sit next to someone that knows what's going on because I don't. And they don't know not to ask you to do anything. And they won't invite you as a guest to honor you with something where you don't want to be on. You know, and I really don't know much. And I'd like to just, the first time I'm here, I'd like to sit next to someone who, who would be welcoming and knows what to do. That's a good seat. Whether it's men, women, that, that, that's, that's the definition of a good seat. Okay? So it could be in the middle. It could be in the beginning. And you would not feel uncomfortable in the front if it was someone like that. Right? So it's a question of you having the initiative to tell someone who you are. And it's not mea culpa, you know, I didn't have an education, I moved here, you know, my father didn't know my mother, so I didn't want to go to synagogue, you know, my mother was Christian, my father was not that, a big fight. I'm not interested, I don't know where you want to sit, that's all. <laughs> so you don't have to tell me a whole life story, but just a little bit, okay? So that is the, that is the, the way to find a good seat, okay? Next. Someone said there were kosher prayer books and non-kosher prayer books. What's the definition of a non-kosher prayer book? I'm going to define it with you. It's never been opened. It has no tears in it. I'm speaking metaphorically. It hasn't been dedicated to somebody. It's impersonal. Now, if I went to my prayer book, if you look in the front here, usually people give them and dedicate them. And I have one in my little cubby underneath there, not this row, but the others, where I keep my prayer book, and it says, uh, given by Virginia and Robert Hurt uh, in honor of, uh, in memory of Samuel Hurt, my father. I like to keep it there. It's only a piece of paper, it doesn't mean much, but I feel it's, you know, my father's here. He died many years ago, so I can recall it that way. Or it could be in honor of someone. And people do that. 
and they make a contribution at the anniversary of someone's death or some other joyous occasion. And that's how it gets replenished, not in a mechanical way, but by people who are here. So if you had your own and you had written notes on the side and you can write notes in your prayer book and you wanted them with your notes, come to the synagogue, you'll bring your notes. So if you bring your notes, whose sitter is it now? Whose prayer book is it? So the idea is to take ownership of the prayer book, not just to have one, okay? So what's a non-kosher prayer book? Define it for me. Never been used and never been used by you. by you. So if I were you, and that once I got used to a place, I'd want to buy my own, even if it's the same that's here. Now, you have a key pot in your head, right? Yes. What's the difference between yours and mine? That's your personalized. This is your personal. What made it personalized? Did you put your name on it? Or? Well, someone made it, right. It also stays on because I need Velcro, which I can't put because there's no place to put it. But it's, it's my own. And that's why you'll see kipot sometimes that are crocheted or some that are knitted and, and different colors and so forth. Not the big bummits for ones or the other ones that are going to slide off if there's a window of someone sneezes, which is the one that you have on right now. So but that's available for people, but it's not your own. If I had a talit, I wanted it to be my own. A prayer book, a chumash, you, you're going to receive one from JC. It should become your own. You can write notes of your feelings of what you learned inside. It's not desecrating it. It's not the Torah scroll. So I think it's taking ownership of Judaism rather than trying to adjust to it. You have to make it your own. So. Sometimes you're in a, if you're in a service, you're going to see people going like this. A lot of shaking. Now, some people would say it's because they're shaking because they're trembling before God. Others, because they might be asked to do something up there like you, which you didn't want to do, right? <laughs> okay. uh, but no more, right? No more. Okay. And, and others would say it's just a way to be comfortable instead of standing like a stiff. Now, for a 10-minute service, you can do that. But people are comfortable. So sometimes, they, sometimes it's for concentration. Sometimes it's for fervor. Sometimes it's emotion. Like the guy getting up, if you think it looks funny, look at anyone who's getting up on a basketball court to take the foul shot. He's standing here, he's going like that, he's going like that, he's going like that. <laughs> Everything he's doing there, what's he doing it for? Or he's standing with the bat here and he's going there and, he's going, and the guy on the third base is going here and he's going there, he's giving signals. People want to be comfortable. So you may see different people doing different things. Now, that is a plus. But for the uninitiated, it looks rather crazy. Why aren't they sitting respectfully? And some people stand low, they sit more, because it's hard to be in a long service. And it's not a service which requires rapt attention. It just requires compatibility with it. I'm going to learn something. I'm going to see something. I'm going to meet some people. Maybe even after the service, someone would invite me to come to the house for lunch without trying to hit on me. Or they might invite you to upstairs there's a coalition or a kiddush afterwards, and people sit and talk with each other. In this building, at 9.45 in the morning, on Saturday morning, uh, at 9 o'clock is the, 7.30 is an early service for insomniacs. No, uh, some insomniacs, some people don't like the main service, some people want to get home and study afterwards at the end of the day, and I have a long service, so they'll finish in two hours, so they'll come a quarter to eight, they finish a quarter to 10. The main service is 10 o'clock. On the fifth floor, on, then at 9.30 is a service, hmm? 9 o'clock. Main service, 9 o'clock. Were you invited? Were you invited to this? Okay, all right. You're a birthright group? <laughs> Have you heard this before, this talk? Okay. Um, I'll introduce you to it later. Don't take away my, uh, my privileges. So, uh, that's my wife, Virginia. Uh, so, uh, where was I before I rudely interrupted you? Uh, <laughs> The main service is 9 o'clock. At 9.30, there's a service here for, uh, it's called Young Leadership. People in their 20s to their 30s, generally with very good Jewish studies background. Some are married, some single. And there are about 200 people in, in, come to that service. At 10 o'clock, on the 10th floor, there's a thing called Manhattan Jewish Experience. That's for people usually with limited background. There are 100 to 150 people come to that. Their prayer book is Hebrew, English, and transliteration. And these are people who are looking to learn more about Judaism. They went to birthright, other kinds of things. So by 11.40, we had the, eight, seven, the, begin, the early service, early bird special. It was a quarter to eight. The main service was at? Nine. The uh, young leadership was at? Nine thirty. The main, and when did they start reading the Torah in the main synagogue? Ten. Ten. They finish at about? 
and at, at and the and the uh, the MGE service started at ten, and it finished around eleven thirty, quarter to twelve. And what happens here at what happens at twelve o'clock? Pandemonium. What happens? Yeah. Everybody's finished. Everyone's here. So there is a sense of mix of people. Older people saying, "Why are all those young people getting to the kiddush before me?" Younger people saying, "What are the old people doing here? Uh, who do I know that I not know?" People have a chance to meet each other. And then people go home for lunch on a Saturday morning because most people here spend the day, the Sabbath, as a full day, not just going to a service. So the service is a, is a part, part, but not the total. In the same way that prayer is a part of Judaism, but it's not the total. Study is, not, is only a piece of it, it's not all of it. But if you put it all together, you have a sense of community, a sense of peoplehood, a sense of history, a feeling, emotional connection, and a recognizing that I would say one is living Jewishly through that experience, of which the synagogue will never again, will anyone in this room ever feel like an, you're only gonna feel like, but it requires an investment of time and effort. So what I wanted to do this evening was to sort of give you a sense of the, of, the, of the place and pretty much a synagogue in general, regardless of its denomination, the things I spoke about today are applicable to everyone. So it's not about am I this, I'm that, I'm this religious, I'm not religious. It's not relevant. What is relevant is that it's a place that I can feel some connection to at moments of need, at moments of appreciation, of moments of recognition, which in essence is Always. So I would say the goal is to live prayerfully, not to pray all day. Okay? Questions? What didn't I cover? What questions do you have? What's the denomination of the synagogue? It's an Orthodox synagogue. Now, Orthodox synagogues, um, generally the service is primarily in Hebrew. Uh, the, the, the knowledge base of the people is generally extensive. Many went to Jewish day schools, not all. I'd say probably 20% of people do not come from traditional backgrounds, but they married people who were traditional, became traditional themselves. It's not all that they all came from super Jewish homes. It's not true. And um, the age distribution in the main service is anywhere from kids. I left out the preschool services and, mm -hmm. and, and kindergarten kinds of things and taught things, all that kind of stuff goes on. And, Teens are youth leaders, and so it's a serious program for them. So not just to get rid of the kids so the parents can sit there quietly, but it's like to give them an enriched experience at their level. Um, so the Orthodox service is generally much more in Hebrew, much less directed from the front. There's an assumption of knowledge, therefore it's important, not, it's important to know two things. One, be, before whom I stand and next to whom I will sit. And to sit next to someone more knowledgeable, that will be helpful. Uh, so the service is primarily in Hebrew. Uh, uh, what else can I say? Men and women sit separately. Uh, the idea is not sexist. The idea was to, I say, prevent um, a totally social environment. That was its goal. Uh, so it's not a, opposed to women being involved in study or involved in prayer, but the traditional element had it as a male male-led service. Well, there's a male-led service. Uh, Virginia is the president of the synagogue here, uh, but also there are women scholars and residents, and it's expected today within Orthodox communities that men and men, women will have a parallel education from preschool through, at least through high school and a year or two of study in Israel. That's the assumption. So I think that the ritual things may be different from Orthodox synagogues from others, but men and women sit separately. In some synagogues, women will sit upstairs, like in, there's a balcony there, but it's only used because of space considerations. Otherwise, the men and women, the women sit on each side. So the sight lines are good. Uh, and uh, the hope is that the congregation is active in its singing and participation. Everyone feels a part of it, even though not everybody is getting up to get, uh, participate in the service. Like, for example, uh, not only women would not want to participate in the service, you didn't want to participate in the service. But for them, it's a different kind of consideration. Reform services are generally shorter much more English, conservative, or somewhere in between. The Orthodox congregations today almost have 100% participation all year. So it's, it's not just like Rosh Hashanah Kippur, the attendance is larger. In fact, it's smaller in Rosh Hashanah Kippur because many young people go home to their families, and this is located in the middle of the city. But there are classes here and opportunities for catch up or for, for participation. But that's what I could describe the differences of Orthodox conservative reform in a different way. But the synagogue service, the structure of the synagogue will probably be pretty much the same. The use of the prayer book and use of a Torah reader will be the same. Um, that's basically the picture. What else? Anyone can come, right? 
Excellent. One does not be, need to be a member to come to any synagogue. Yeah. Membership is generally a one-year payment in the beginning of the year, usually around Rosh Hashanah, to support the institutions because they're voluntary institutions. But uh, to participate, one need not be a member. Mm -hmm. But still for holidays, some synagogues... They sold tickets because they wanted to support themselves. There's no other way to do it. Generally speaking, though, if someone did not have a ticket, they called up the rabbi, I'd like to come, no one's going to ever say, how much are you going to pay? Mm -hmm. Okay, and there are some services that are free entirely. Frankly, I don't think that's a great idea because I think it doesn't teach responsibility. I'd rather come to a place where people pay, and I'm not asked to because, or I'll make a contribution, whatever I think is reasonable in light of where I'm at to in life. But to sustain an 11-story building, you have to have membership dues, you have to have rental spaces, you have to have programmatic things, but it's not a pay-as-you-go thing. Uh, people contribute what they can contribute. There's a suggested amount, but people are never locked out because of money. What else? Did you have a synagogue where you grew up? Yeah. Tell me about it. No. Tell me about it. No. Where, what city was it in? Mm -hmm. Ekaterinburg. Okay. There was a synagogue there? Yes. Did you go? Same. Same structure? Yes. Okay. Were, did young people go? Not always, but sometimes. Sometimes. Yes. For holidays? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you start to go when you were young? Mm, when my mother started to go. To what, changed, what changed that your mother wanted to go? I don't know why she came there. You didn't ask her? What do you think, Anna? Well, I think it started when I left, because before I left, I kind of was bringing the whole Jewish theme into the house. And then when I left, my mom started going, and then my sister got into camps and kind of pulled where okay. I Okay. Her mother just came here two months ago. Yeah, two months. My family just came and gave my mom and my sister three Mom's months ago. Three months ago. Her mother and her sister. And um, we met, as I said, through a birthright program. And I say that this is one of the miracles of life, that uh, more than a million Jews left the FSU, many in Israel, many in New York, other places. And who would have imagined that we have, would have left Egypt? And who would have imagined that people would have left Russia? So there are, there are miracles in life. Any other questions or comments you want to make? Julie, any? Okay. Okay. Virginia, what do you want to say? I mentioned before, well, 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 see what I see, remember, whose plaque is that in there? Great grandfather. What did he, what was he in the synagogue? Okay, and uh, when, did this, when, did, when did he, what was he the president here? How long ago? 1917. 19, who said that? 1917, correct. Okay, so that, by the way, very, something very interesting. If you lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey, you might go to the Ridgewood Jewish Center. If you lived in Passaic, you go to Passaic Jewish Center. If you live in, 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 in uh, Princeton, you go to Princeton Jewish Center. If you here, you go to the Jewish Center. Why the? This was the first. This was the first institution in America that had the word the, uh, the first Jewish Center, actually. So it's at the Jewish Center. Okay? In America? Any place in the world. Nothing ever had that name. It was the first shoe of the pool. <laughs> there used to be a pool upstairs, a gymnasium. That's why it was called Jewish Center, because it was everything in one place, which you can imagine was pretty revolutionary in 1917. People didn't think of synagogues as having a swimming pool and gymnasiums. So the idea is to meet the needs of people always, to be the center of Jewish life. There are two centers of Jewish life in our community. One is the synagogue and the other is, what do you think? The home. That's why the next time we're going to meet, you're going to meet at our home. And it will be our pleasure to host you and to try to talk about Jewish holidays. Yes, Julie? Oh, I don't want to interrupt you, but I do want to, I do think of the common language. So, so we want you to see the two perspectives to get to know us a little bit because what you're doing is very important here. It's really a, a, an important step you're taking in your own lives to take ownership of your Jewish life and to learn more and to meet more people who would share that aspiration. So it is a journey. Someone said earlier, that's what the prayer book is, it's a journey. And I think it's a wonderful one, and you should be very, very <coughs> proud of what you're doing. Yes, Julie. I just wanted to share that this session, I don't know if you guys realize, it's, it's really a gift. Um, I'm one of the people that Rabbi Hurt was referred to, 
who grew up without a traditional background. I grew up totally secular. My parents are from Hungary, grew up in communism, so sort of a similar uh, background. And I had to pick it all up. I had to scramble, you know, and kind of figure out why people were doing certain things, what all that meant, like what the objects were. I, I actually have never had a session like this. Um, and it's just so exciting that you guys are having it now at the beginning. Um, so just, just so you know, this is very unique um, and just really amazing opportunity. Now tell him why, you're, why I wanted you to come. What's your, tell him what your project is. Sure. By um, the way, on the seventh floor in this building, there's a, an organization called Present Tense. It's a group, which you can tell about in a moment, which Virginia and I got involved in, but primarily Virginia, with a group in Israel. And they opened a base in America, and she worked with those people to have it here on the seventh floor. So Julie is involved in that. And just tell them, because I think it's fascinating for them. Sure. Um, I'll, use, I'll use his language of insiders and outsiders. Uh, on Shabbat, on Saturdays, in the morning, there's the big service, the three-hour service that's sort of like the, the peak and everyone kind of goes to that. There's also an afternoon service, um, which has all the things that we just saw with the Torah and, and, and the prayer and all that. And it's a shorter service, but it's very much right now an insider service. Uh, if you were to walk in, it's, no one would, no one would explain things to you. No one, uh, only in the most sensitive uh, synagogues, but you probably wouldn't even go. You wouldn't even know what time it was. My idea is to create a network of participating Jewish communities um, that use the afternoon service as an additional entry point on Shabbat. It's a better time. <laughs> it's not 9 or 10 in the morning. It's after lunch. It's in the afternoon. Um, and it's actually a really lovely way to, to begin um, being engaged with Shabbat. There could be learning afterwards. There could be food similar to the morning. And then there's also the lovely Havdalah service, which is separation between Shabbat and the rest of the week. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still at the idea stage, but uh, was lucky, lucky enough to be connected with Rabbi Hurt, so he invited me here. So when I saw what her project was, because we're involved in that present tense group, I said, <laughs> I'm very interested in that because I think it's a great idea. So we met last week, and Friday, Friday and, and I said, it would be great if you came because I think that if people are going to come for the first time on a Shabbat afternoon, no matter how well you're going to do it, if they're not prepared, it's not going to happen well. So I wanted to just look this as an example an educational opportunity to look at it and with you so we can now have a shared experience and say what would be the best way if you had to invite someone and you couldn't ask them, you didn't, you didn't want to wait that I just showed up and find a good seat next to someone who's going to help you. I want to get a little preparation if we could. If not, maybe there are other ways to do it. But this is one way to do it, especially with a group that is spending eight weeks thinking through their own Jewish journey and, 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 and growing together as a community. So that's why I'm glad that you're here. And, uh, it's a chance for me to meet you too, which was nice. And you can meet Virginia too. And uh, for Anna, we, we heard from the beginning. So thanks a lot for coming. And anytime you want to come here, you can just call us in advance and we will make sure that you get a good seat. <laughs> and uh, uh, why, did, why, does, why does she sit in the middle of the right? Thank you. I, I knew you were coming. I made sure that I did that first. <laughs> Grandmother sat there, and so, uh, and people in the synagogue who've been here for, some people remember her grandfather, and some people certainly, or many people knew, great grandfather knew her grandmother, so they always say, oh, Virginia, remember your grandmother used to sit here, and then your grandmother did this, and your grandmother did that. And so it's, it's a very supportive thing, you know, different generational things, and uh, sometimes it's good to be with people your own age, sometimes it's good to be with people of different ages, and you hear different things and learn different things, so. It's a good human ex uh, interchange, okay? So, okay, guys, thank you very much.